The Three Sisters by W. W. Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. The Three Sisters by W. W. Jacobs. Thirty years ago, on a wet, autumn evening, the household of Mallet's Lodge was gathered round the deathbed of Ursula Mallow, the eldest of the three sisters who inhabited it. The dingy, moth-eaten curtains of the old wooden bedstead were drawn apart. The light of a smoking oil lamp falling upon the hopeless countenance of the dying woman, as she turned her dull eyes upon her sisters, the room was in silence, except for an occasional sob from her youngest sister, Eunice. Outside, the rain fell steadily over the steaming marshes. "'Nothing is to be changed, Tabitha,' gasped Ursula to the other sister, who bore a striking resemblance to her, although her expression was harder and colder. This room is to be locked up and never opened. Very well, said Tabitha brusquely, though I don't see how it can matter to you then. It does matter, said her sister with startling energy. How do you know? How do you know that I may not sometimes visit it? I have lived in this house so long. I am certain that I shall see it again. I will come back, come back to watch over you both, and see that no harm befalls you." "'You are talking wildly,' said Tabitha, by no means moved by her sister's solicitude for her welfare. "'Your mind is wandering. You know that I have no faith in such things.' Ursula sighed and beckoned to Eunice who was weeping silently at the bedside, placed her feeble arms round her neck and kissed her. "'Do not weep, dear,' she said feebly. "'Perhaps it is best so. A lonely woman's life is scarcely worth living. We have no hopes, no aspirations. Other women have had happy husbands and children. But we in this forgotten place have grown old together. I go first, but you must soon follow." Tabitha, comfortably conscious of only forty years and an iron frame, shrugged her shoulders and smiled grimly. "'I go first, repeated Ursula, in a new and strange voice, as her heavy eyes slowly closed. But I will come for each of you in turn, when your lease of life runs out. At that moment I will be with you, to lead your steps whither I now go." As she spoke the flickering lamp went out suddenly, as though extinguished by a rapid hand, and the room was left in utter darkness. A strange, suffocating noise issued from the bed, and when the trembling women had relighted the lamp, all that was left of Ursula Mallow was ready for the grave. That night the survivors passed together. The dead woman had been a firm believer in the existence of that shadowy borderland which is said to form an unhallowed link between the living and the dead. And even the stolid Tabitha, slightly unnerved by the events of the night, was not free from certain apprehensions that she might have been right. With the bright morning their fears disappeared. The sun stole in the window, and seeing the poor earthworm face on the pillow so touched it, and glorified it that only its goodness and weakness were seen and the beholders came to wonder how they could ever have felt any dread of aught, 
so calm and peaceful. A day or two passed, and the body was transferred to a massive coffin, long regarded as the finest piece of work of its kind ever turned out of the village carpenter's workshop. Then a slow and melancholy cortege headed by four bearers wound its solemn way across the marshes to the family vault in the gray old church, and all that was left of Ursula was placed by the father and mother who had taken the self-same journey some thirty years before. To Eunice, as they toiled slowly home, the day seemed strange and Sabbath-like, the flat prospect of marsh wider and more forlorn than usual, the roar of the sea more depressing. Tabitha had no such fancies. The bulk of the dead woman's property had been left to Eunice, and her avarice soul was sorely troubled and her proper sisterly feelings of regret, for the deceased sadly interfered with it in consequence. "'What are you going to do with all that money, Eunice?' she asked as they sat at their quiet tea. "'I shall leave it as it stands,' said Eunice slowly. "'We have both got sufficient to live upon, and I shall devote the income from it to supporting some beds in the children's hospital. "'If Ursula had wished it to go to a hospital,' said Tabitha, in her deep tones, "'she would have left the money to it herself. I wonder you do not respect her wishes more.' "'What else can I do with it, then?' inquired Eunice. "'Save it,' said the other with gleaming eyes. "'Save it. Eunice shook her head. No, said she, it shall go to the sick children. But the principal I will not touch, and if I die before you, it shall become yours, and you can do what you like with it. Very well, said Tabitha, smoldering her anger by a strong effort. I don't believe that was what Ursula meant you to do with it, and I don't believe she will rest quietly in the grave while you squander the money she stored so carefully. "'What do you mean?' asked Eunice with pale lips. "'You are trying to frighten me. I thought that you did not believe in such things.' Tabitha made no answer, and, to avoid the anxious, inquiring gaze of her sister, drew her chair to the fire, and, folding her gaunt arms, composed herself for a nap. For some time life went on quietly in the old house. The room of the dead woman, in accordance with her last desire, was kept firmly locked, its dirty windows forming a strange contrast to the prim cleanliness of the others. Tabitha, never very talkative, became more taciturn than ever, and stalked about the house and the neglected garden like an unquiet spirit. Her brow roughened into deep wrinkles, suggestive of much thought. As the winter came on, bringing with it the long, dark evenings, the old house became more lonely than ever. And an air of mystery and dread seemed to hang over it and brood in its empty rooms and dark corridors. The deep silence of night was broken by strange noises, for which neither the wind nor the rats could be held accountable. Old Martha, seated in her distant kitchen, heard strange sounds upon the stairs, and once, upon hurrying to them, fancied that she saw a dark figure squatting upon the landing, though a subsequent search with a candle and spectacles failed to discover anything. Eunice was disturbed by several vague incidents, and as she suffered from a complaint of the heart, rendered very ill by them. Even Tabitha admitted a strangeness about the house, but, confident in her piety and virtue, took no heed of it, her mind being fully employed in another direction. Since the death of her sister, all restraint upon her was removed, and she yielded herself up entirely to the stern and hard rules enforced by avarice upon its devotees. 
Her housekeeping expenses were kept rigidly separate from those of Eunice, and her food limited to the coarsest dishes, while in the matter of clothes the old servant was by far the better dressed. Seated alone in her bedroom, this uncouth, hard-featured creature reveled in her possessions, grudging even the expense of the candle-end, which enabled her to behold them. So completely did this passion change her that both Eunice and Martha became afraid of her, and lay awake in their beds night after night, trembling at the chinking of coins at her unholy vigils. One day Eunice ventured to remonstrate. "'Why don't you bank your money, Tabitha?' she said. "'It is surely not safe to keep such large sums in such a lonely house.' "'Large sums!' repeated the exasperated Tabitha. "'Large sums! What nonsense is this? You know well that I have barely sufficient to keep me.' "'It is a great temptation to housebreakers,' said her sister, not pressing the point. I made sure last night that I heard somebody in the house. Did you? said Tabitha, grasping her arm, a horrible look on her face. So did I. I thought they went to Ursula's room, and I got out of bed and went on the stairs to listen. Well? said Eunice faintly, fascinated by the look on her sister's face. There was something there, said Tabitha slowly. I'll swear it, for I stood on the landing by her door and listened, something scuffling on the floor round and round the room. At first I thought it was the cat. When I went up there this morning the door was still locked and the cat was in the kitchen. Oh, let us leave this dreadful house, moaned Eunice. What? said her sister grimly. Afraid of poor Ursula? Why should you be? your own sister who nursed you when you were a babe, and who perhaps even now comes and watches over your slumbers. Oh, said Eunice, pressing her hand to her side, if I saw her I should die. I should think that she had come for me, as she said she would. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I am dying. She reeled as she spoke, and before Tabitha could save her, sank senseless to the floor. "'Get some water!' cried Tabitha, as old Martha came hurrying up the stairs. "'Eunice has fainted!' The old woman, with a timid glance at her, retired, reappearing shortly afterwards with the water, with which she proceeded to restore her much-loved mistress to her senses. Tabitha, as soon as this was accomplished, stalked off to her room, leaving her sister and Martha, sitting drearily enough in the small parlour, watching the fire, and conversing in whispers. It was clear to the old servant that this stage of things could not last much longer, and she repeatedly urged her mistress to leave the house so lonely and so mysterious. To her great delight Eunice at length consented, despite the fierce opposition of her sister, and at the mere idea of leaving gained greatly in health and spirits. A small but comfortable house was hired in Morville, and arrangements made for a speedy change. It was the last night in the old house, and all the wild spirits of the marshes, the wind, and the sea seemed to have joined forces for one supreme effort. When the wind dropped, as it did at brief intervals, the sea was heard moaning on the distant beach strangely mingled with the desolate warning of the bell buoy as it rocked on the waves. When the wind rose again, and the noise of the sea was lost in the fierce gusts, which, finding no obstacle on the open marshes, swept with their full fury upon the house by the creek, the strange voices of the air shrieked in its chimneys, windows rattled, doors slammed, and even the very curtains seemed to be alive. Eunice was in bed, awake. A small nightlight, in a saucer of oil, shed a sickly glare upon the worm-eaten old furniture, distorting the most innocent articles into ghastly shapes. A 
a wilder gust than usual almost deprived her of the protection afforded by that poor light and she lay listening fearfully to the creakings and to the other noises on the stairs bitterly regretting that she had not asked martha to sleep with her but it was not too late even now she slipped hastily to the floor crossed to the huge wardrobe and was in the very act of taking her dressing-gown from its peg when an unmistakable footfall was heard on the stairs the robe dropped from her shaking fingers and with a quickly beating heart she regained her bed the sounds ceased and a deep silence followed which she herself was unable to break although she strove hard to do so a wild gust of wind shook the windows and nearly extinguished the light and when its flame had regained its accustomed steadiness she saw that the door was slowly opening while the huge shadow of a hand blotted the papered wall still her tongue refused its office the door flew open with a crash a cloaked figure entered and throwing aside its covering she saw with a horror past all expression the napkin-bound face of the dead ursula smiling terribly at her in her last extremity she raised her faded eyes above for succor and then as the figure noiselessly advanced and laid its cold hand upon her brow the soul of eunice mallow left its body with a wild shriek and made its way to the eternal martha roused by the cry and shivering with dread rushed to the door and gazed in terror at the figure which stood leaning over the bedside as she watched it slowly removed the cowl and the napkin and exposed the fell face of tabitha so strangely contorted between fear and triumph that she hardly recognized it who's there cried tabitha in a terrible voice as she saw the old woman's shadow on the wall i thought i heard a cry said martha entering did anybody call yes eunice said the other regarding her closely i too heard the cry and hurried to her what makes her so strange is she in a trance ay said the old woman falling on her knees by the bed and sobbing bitterly the trance of death oh my dear my poor lonely girl that this should be the end of it she has died of fright said the old woman pointing to the eyes which even yet retained their horror she has seen something devilish tabitha's gaze fell she has always suffered with her heart she muttered the night has frightened her it frightened me she stood upright by the foot of the bed as martha drew the sheet over the face of the dead woman first ursula then eunice said tabitha drawing a deep breath i can't stay here i'll dress and wait for the morning she left the room as she spoke and with bent head proceeded to her own martha remained by the bedside and gently closed the staring eyes fell on her knees and prayed long and earnestly for the departed soul overcome with grief and fear she remained with a bowed head until a sudden sharp cry from tabitha brought her to her feet well said the old woman going to the door where are you cried tabitha somewhat reassured by her voice in miss eunice's bedroom do you want anything come down at once quick i am unwell her voice rose suddenly to a scream quick for god's sake quick or i shall go mad there is some strange woman in the house the old woman stumbled hastily down the stairs what is the matter she cried entering the room who is it what do you mean i saw it said tabitha gasping her convulsively by the shoulder i was coming to you when i saw the figure of a woman 
in front of me going up the stairs. Is it? Can it be Ursula coming for the soul of Eunice, as she said she would? Or for yours? said Martha, the words coming from her in an odd fashion, despite herself. Tabitha, with a ghastly look, fell cowering by her side, clutching tremulously at her clothes. Light the lamps, she cried hysterically. Light a fire, make a noise. Oh, this dreadful darkness! Will it never be day? Soon, soon, said Martha, overcoming her repugnance and trying to pacify her. The day comes when we will laugh at these fears. I murdered her, screamed the miserable woman. I killed her with fright. Why did she not give me the money? It was no use to her. Oh, look there. Martha, with a horrible fear, followed her glance to the door, but saw nothing. It's Ursula, said Tabitha from between her teeth. Keep her off! Keep her off! The old woman who by some unknown sense seemed to feel the presence of a third person in the room, moved to step forward and stood before her. As she did so, Tabitha waved her arms as though to free herself from the touch of a detaining hand, half rose to her feet, and without a word fell dead before her. At this the old woman's courage forsook her, and with a great cry she rushed from the room, eager to escape from this house of death and mystery. The bolts of the great door were stiff with age. The strange voices seemed to ring in her ears as she strove wildly to unfasten them. Her brain whirled. She thought that the dead in their distant rooms called her, and that a devil stood on the step outside laughing and holding the door against her. Then, with a supreme effort, she flung it open, and heedless of her night clothes, passed into the bitter night. The path across the marshes was lost in the darkness, but she found it. The planks over the ditches slippery and narrow, but she crossed them in safety, until at last, her feet bleeding and her breath coming in great gasps, she entered the village and sank down more dead than alive on a cottage doorstep. End of the Three Sisters Recording by Capricia Page